Does art do for us today what it did for people thousands of years ago? The poet T.S. Eliot, when he encountered the prehistoric cave paintings at Lascaux, had an immense moment of recognition that art, as he says, never changes. Um, and I wonder, what exactly is it about art that hasn't changed since these ancient people painted these animals on the caves? Is it the ability to, to essentially create something out of nothing? Or is it the act of expressing oneself um, and letting that expression go uh, wherever it's coming from? Is it, is it the sort of magic of taking a material that's visual or auditory and connecting people through that? Or is it taking that sort of magical material and using it to connect uh, individuals and groups of people to, to something universal. Um, the book that I'm working on now, The Walls, begins with a quote from the poet and philosopher Hakim Bey, and it goes, the fact that we find Lascaux beautiful means that Babylon has at last begun to fall. And I see in that a change that I see in the world that allows myself as an artist, um, an artist Artists often feel disconnected from the regular social functioning because we're, we're worried about these bigger questions. And also, art doesn't always have a place in society the way some things do. Um, but I, I, more and more, I see people who are similar, similarly disaffected um, from the sort of social expectations that we have when we hang out and what our opportunities are, or they're not finding satisfaction in their jobs. Um, the, you know, the, the sort of status quo of what a marriage is isn't necessarily something you know, that, that people are always happy with these days. Um, and also just the things that religion and, and, and accepted thought uh, had sort of been spoon-fed to people. I see a lot of people who aren't artists turning away from that. And what I, what I feel is that there is a desire to return to the innate mystery of what we are uh, and what we've always been. I had a great teacher when I was a graduate student, the, the poet Franz Wright, and he, he would say, sort of in, in moments of inspiration, he would say that poetry returns us to a primal awe. That stuck with me. Another thing he said that sort of pairs with it, it's very different, is he says, poets are eternally adolescent, um, which obviously is, you know, you're laughing at that, so we know. It was, it was in eighth grade that I decided I was going to be a poet, and I was going to shuck off all of these other things things that people were trying to offer me. You know, I was um, constantly trying to go back to a state of wonder that at 13 years old, I'd already understood that I'd lost from when I was four. Um, you know, take this class so you can have this job. Ha talk to women this way so you can have this kind of a relationship. Hang out with people like this so you'll be, you know, normal in a social situation. Here's this religion that you can have. Here's your choices. And so I, I found myself constantly, you know, kind of setting those things aside. And what happened is I was kind of alone, you know. There's not a lot of eighth graders reading Henry David Thoreau at lunchtime in the library, but I was. And so I found in Walden uh, a quote that's always stuck with me. Why must they eat their 60 acres when men are condemned only to their speck of dust? And so here I was with this little tiny point of earth that I had to have with me in the immensity of the universe, uh, so I turned to other writers for an idea of what do you do now and when what you have is art. The poet Ezra Pound said, make it new. Take that cave painting in Lascaux and make it something that's never been done before. Another, one of the most important poets in, in, my, in my career has been Wallace Stevens. And one of the things that he said about art, what makes great poetry, is it must change. The poem must somehow have a transformation through it. There's this sort of point A to point B. So in Shakespeare's sonnets, in the first part of the poem, you have uh, a question, and in the second part, you have an answer. There's a shift. Or you have a sort of rhetoric and then a resolution. You know, in the East, in the haiku form, you have, it's a very short form, but you have an experience with the natural world, and then you have an awareness. And so I wanted to do that in my poems, and as a grad student, you know, I wanted to write poems that, that did what Wallace Stevens and Ezra Pound said, 
but I didn't have any awareness of what was going on around me. I didn't have any questions to any answers. I couldn't resolve any rhetoric. I didn't know who I was or my place in the world. So what I did was I fabricated things. So I would go out on a Friday night after classes were done and get just blitzed. Wake up from an oblivion and sort of crawl out of that. So see, I'm changing. Um, you know, I'd get into bad relationships and they'd fall apart and I'd be all heartbroken and I could write my way out of that. And as soon as I was out, of course, I'd go right back to, you know, to another bad relationship. And the easiest thing to do is just hate myself and think that I was worthless and go through all that self-loathing and kind of, oh, I'm not so bad. At least there's a bird outside. So <laughs> some of the poems in my, f my first book do that. Um, some of the poems in my first book do that. So I'm going to read one of those. Poets love to, self, to deprecate their own work in front of an audience. This is called Apology for a Miserable Spring. Implacable hosts sexed sex beyond repair require meaningless babble from a stranger, however awkward. Repair? Break enough you mind no end. In cordial means worse, unless in a glass afterwards smashed. One religion blesses children with water. God blessed me with broken glass this morning on my filthy block. Last night, all words now, even images reduced to sounds. I don't have to respect what wasn't, whatever was. And so it's, this is, that poem's seven, eight, nine years old. And when I look at it now, I see, well, it starts at point A, and it goes in a circle and comes back to point A. It's sort of static in its non-transformation, you know? And the thing that's enticing, I think, about poetry, about pain, is that, you know, pain is it's ever-changing. You never understand it. It's irrational. Therefore, it's beautiful. The problem with constantly cycling through pain is, is the source for art is that it's not really, it doesn't really belong to us. You know, pain is what you feel when you lose a parent or when a relationship falls apart or a friend disappoints you. You know, it's just, it's, it's not something that allows f f for that sort of transformation that I think Stevens and Elliot were talking about. So what happened was in the last year or so, well, my marriage of 10 years ended. So there's a sort of a cycle there that stopped. And I stopped drinking. And so there's a cycle there that sort of stopped for me. And then I, I made a conscious decision just to stop hating myself, to let my friends show me love, to love myself. I started practicing yoga and going to therapy and just you know, drinking more water and things like that. <laughs> and so I had this idea that to, so maybe I could write these poems that moved me from a, from a point A to a point B that showed you know, that I was moving from self-destruction to recovery. And one of my closest friends, a poet who lives in town here, Kaveh, Sims Kaveh Basiri, he was out of town, and I'd been staying with him after my separation, but he was gone for about a month, and I stayed in his house. And I wrote this to him the morning after the last night of oblivion. Kaveh's window. The song is tired, friend, in the aftermath of polyphonic fuck-ups on a Thursday night with the wind out and the stars down, dead pigeons near a vodka bottle in the berm. When you come back, let's watch a movie. Hungarians dancing after closing time. The darkest choose mad disaster over terminal sorrow. I have come to believe the only good people are poor. In my stubborn religion, I deny all contrary evidence. I tried believing nothing, and it got me nothing. But I woke up after 10 minutes sleep in the apartment you gave me for two weeks. Only a friend would not ask me to describe the trees out your window in the winter light, orange and blue and white light in the ice, because you have been there, Kave, because you have slept in that bed and lived to tell about it. I saw the squirrel this morning on the roof below your window, and for a moment I wanted to say something to anyone, and I suppose that is where religion begins, the house we must enter when we close the final door. There is no world until all our friends are there. And so I thought when I started writing poems this way that I was going to get from, you know, I'm, I'm in pain, point A, point B, I'm over pain. But it wasn't. It was, I'm in pain, 
And they moved to point C. Oh, I have friends. You know? And then in this poem, there was also the, I moved from a point A to point Q. There's this thing, religion, that I had always sort of abstained from in my life that people were trying to sort of feed to me in different ways in my recovery. And I thought, well, what is religion? What does it do for people today that it did for people thousands of years ago? Does it show us how something can come from nothing? Does it show us that, does it give us an outlet to express the things that we feel? Does it connect people? Does it connect us with something universal? And so then I, I started to think, well, you know, what do I do now? Because <laughs> I can't destroy myself. I can't go back. How am I going to write anything interesting? And then I, I came across this quote from Buddha that has sort of been my guide through this sort of new life that I found. And it says, in the end, there are only three things that matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of those things that were not meant for you. And so I live in this world where I have this four-and-a-half-year-old daughter who's my best friend, who I steal most of my poetry from now. Don't tell her. Um, <laughs> You know, I have the, these great friends. I've reconnected with my poetry. I'm healthy. But the world is still a place where there's drones and poor people starving and all this grief. Well, so, so I thought, well, those things are not meant for me. And so I, I'll read one more poem. It's a little more recent. I don't get home much anymore. Cancer stink on the interstates through Missouri and Illinois. No dreams induce sleep. Home, the word, represents what's closer to grass and trees, a mind away from smoke. The home I lived in, all the trees coordinate, paralysis and a shot of strychnine. Now I prefer stoned mountain roads. I live in a box in the mountains, yes, but my parents don't cry in their words there. I broke their mouths against my door. I locked myself inside with my daughter, in her laughter, the shotgun I hold to my head. My light-crazed head grins in the trees, shining through the window. I've been told to stop talking about light, to think money language, to think military-industrial complex squid children shutters, to drop drones everywhere. But light, friends, enters through the windows without breaking anything. Light makes the trees, and light makes my daughter laugh. Not a weapon, my daughter when the world is made of light. Mind glows its own solution. Mind not like the moon, not reflecting, but origin, a child laughing when her daddy laughs, one bird laughing after another. I don't go home. What fire alights has burned out, what has resolved in its ash hardly holds anything. A house will not stand after emptying. Places away from the disasters, let me breathe out. I open the door and let my daughter run down sidewalks full of commerce. So why this poem was different for me is because it starts at a point A and it ends in pi. And now in that point of aloneness that I felt in the eighth grade, <laughs> I'm surrounded by this circle of my friends, of my daughter, of myself. Uh, of this world that I live in where I can still look at a bird, but I don't have to be miserable to appreciate it. Wallace Stevens, the poet, one of the poets that I've loved for, for a long time, he, one of the last poems he ended, he's a very philosophical, very personal poet, one of the last poems that he wrote ended kind of strikingly with a very sentimental line. The final soliloquy of the interior paramour, it ends, being here together is enough. And that's what I feel art has done for me that does, you know, may, possibly does for all of us, po possibly has for centuries. And so now the mantra, the, the one sustaining thing comes from the great 20th century thinker, Fred Rogers, who said, there's three ways to ultimate success. The first way is kindness. The second way is kindness. And the third way is kindness. So we begin alone and we end in a completion that is endless. 